Sparks, I do want you to go back to your sedimentary rocks lab, and I, and I have it here as well. Uh, you can see there's graded bedding, so I include some good pictures here. And so make, we'll, we'll refer back to these, uh, these photos to help us with this lab this week, right? Mud cracks, cross bedding, uh, graded bedding, uh, sole marks here, or the, in, in this case, trackways. Uh, in fact, in this lab, we're going to introduce a new term called a, a, a sole mark. All right, so we'll come back to that in a moment. And so again, cross bedding, mud cracks, uh, ripple marks, graded beds, uh, fossils like the track, the track we saw there. Uh, so you can look at fossils here because fossils can tell us something about past deposition environments. Um, you know, for example, clams, um, uh, brachiopods, uh, shell, shelled organisms, they, they're not going to be living in the abyssal plain. They're, they're going to be in neuritic waters, not pelagic waters. Right? So shallow waters where, there are, where there's more nutrients and more food for them, right? Um, so uh, what, but plankton, plankton's going to be all over the ocean. So usually plankton is going to be in the deeper marine environments, right? So here I have microorganisms, which are the plankton, right? They're going to be farther out in the deep marine ocean. Uh, whereas in the shallow waters, you're going to see more of the, of the clams and the, and the coral and um, the, the crustaceans and different organisms, echinoderms, which are the, the sea stars and sand dollars, right? They're going to be sh shallow waters. All right, so the fossils can help us determine where organisms have lived in the past. And then when we're looking at bedding, I remember uh, the key feature of sedimentary rocks is, is bedding strata, and each bed represents a change in energy or depositional setting, right? Something changed to make a new bed, right? There was a uh, in fact, uh, when we talk about the planar bedding here, uh, so this is the first part talking about this plane bedding. Well, what's causing the different layers? Well, here we have an example where sand is coming in, maybe a, a stream is bringing the sand in, then it gets quiet and the, the, the sand, the sediment compacts, right? Remember there's, there's um, uh, burial, compaction, cementation, the three steps of lithification. So here we start burying it, right? So it gets buried and that leads to overburden pressure, which is compaction. And then uh, lithification would be the cement that holds or cementation that holds the grains together. And then, a, then another event happens, right? So now this is one event, the energy change. Here we had higher energy, then the energy dropped off. Then another episode of higher energy, and then it's gonna repeat the same cycle. That's gonna give us another bed, right? So that's the stratification. And another model is if we're, if we're in shallow waters or deeper waters, we see sediment settling down on the sea floor, then it's quiet for a while. Uh, there's no input of sediment. This compacts, uh, cements, to, and lithifies into a, a stratum, a layer, and then another event happens, right? So again, uh, the key feature of sedimentary beds is the, strat the layers of stratification, right? So that's what they're talking about here. And you can see when we're looking at beddings, we have different size categories, right? So bedding goes from thin to thick, and usually we just say thin to thick. Um, but we do want to distinction, make a distinction between bedding and laminations. The laminations are going to be very thin, less than one centimeter. Remember, one centimeter is a little bit less than half an inch, right? So they're, they're pretty thin. Usually these, are, these are, occur in, um, in maybe a glacial wind deposits, something called LOS, L-O, L-O-E-S-S, -S, or in um, something else called VARs, which are glacial lakes where there's seasonal deposition that goes on there. Um, very quiet water, so they, or maybe a big lake that doesn't get a whole lot of sedimentation, uh, so maybe uh, quiet lacustrine waters as well. And then uh, where we're seeing bioturbation, that must mean there's, you know, there's activity uh, from organisms burrowing into the, into the sediment. And then here is that plain bedding sediment that I'm talking about here. The other type of sediment or, or bedding we talk about is that cross bedding. And in this lab, we're going to differentiate between uh, this, this tabular planar. In fact, it's really called uh, tabular planar cross bedding. I think, yeah, tabular planar cross bedding. And the other one's called trough cross bedding. And as far as I can tell, um, the tabular cross bedding is more common to... Um, wind deposits here. In fact, let's see if I have it up here. Um, 
Yeah, tabular crossbedding formed by wind is often confused with tabular planar crossbedding formed by fluvial process. Yeah, so so we can get it in both. We can get it in 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 small streams and in big sand dunes, like in the desert or big coastal dunes, right? And uh, the only difference between the tabular crossbedding due to water current is that these forsets, which are the crossbeds, so these kind of layers that are in, that are inclined to the overall bedding. So remember, the overall bedding is horizontal. This is a bedding plane right there. There's another one up there. So so we, so it satisfies that principle of original horizontality. They're horizontal, but just that the individual forsets are inclined because when they're deposited, they they they're deposited in the slope. Think about a sand dune. Remember, a sand dune has a slope, a natural slope. And so wind blows material over that, that dune, and then that sand falls down the face of that slope and makes another forset, right? Another forset. So, so the difference between the, the, the tabular cross bedding in streams, fluvial, is these are small. And they're anywhere, I think I, think I put it up there, uh, about 30 degrees or less. And you can actually measure that with a protract. You see it's about 30 degrees. But the wind tro um, cross beds, the only ones, these are huge. They're going to be several feet tall uh, to, you know, 20 feet tall in some cases, some huge dunes. And their forces are usually pretty steep, anywhere from 33 degrees to 35 degrees in some cases. But usually 33 is about the steepest they get. And so that's the difference between the, the aeolian tabular cross beds and these um, fluvial tabular cross beds. And then uh, note that the other ones are the um, trough cross bedding, and these are are going to be mostly in stream deposits. Uh, although, like what we just mentioned, that you can you can get the tabular cross bedding in streams, but um, but these trough cross beddings are going to be in stream deposits. So that's something to think about because there is a photo that looks like this later on that we'll have to um, identify. So here is a little uh, sketch showing them. Um, these very steep beds. So, and also note that the that the cross beds. In fact, do I have a picture of them down here? Oh, no, I don't. The cross beds also tell us the paleo current direction. See these arrows. So the inclination of the cross beds. So they're they're always going incli to be inclined in the direction the current is flowing. Right. So so see they're inclined toward the the right. So the current was flowing toward the right. Here the wind is blowing, at least this top one, it's blowing towards the left and the inclination is toward the left. But note this bottom one, the inclination is to the right. So in the past, when this, when these crosses were formed at the bottom, this first layer here, the wind must have been blowing toward the right here. In fact, here's a little picture showing it toward the right. Now, um, that's an important concept as well. When you see a picture like this, and here I see tabula cross bedding, and I ask you, well, is this is this fluvial tabula, tabula cross bedding or is it wind tabula cross bedding? And when you see this, well, right away they're very steep, so you're, they're, they're probably going to be aeolian wind. But also note that that this first layer, the direction of the current was toward the left because the cross beds are in that direction. But this one, the cross beds are are facing toward the right. So in that environment, winds are blowing in two different directions. So we know it's wind directed because in the desert or in a coastal dune, winds can blow in different direction. But in streams, you're getting the stream only flowing in one direction, right? So that the stream forsets will always be in the same direction in all the layers. Whereas for the Aeolian, you can get alternating directions in the wind. So that's another clue to think about. All right, and then this wedge cross uh, bedding isn't as common. Um, uh, let's see, uh, and it looks like it can be can form in aeolian processes, and, and it's usually in the really big cross beds. Some of these are found in, the, I think it's called Zion. Yeah, Zion National Park has some of these huge uh, wedge cross shaped beddings. I think I might even have a picture of that. We'll we'll see. All right. So the next part here are these graded beds, and so remember going back to our sedimentary rock structures. Here's a classic graded bed, right? So you can tell which way the paleo up direction is, right? because the coarser stuff settles down first, then finer material settles down on top of that. But uh, here we're introducing a new term, a new um, sequence called the Bama sequence. And Bama sequences occur in these turbidites, and they're usually uh, sequence A through E 
uh, the first sequence A is obviously this, this, think about this underwater turbidity current. It's almost like an avalanche underwater. And it's bringing all this sediment down and all the coarse material settles down first. And then the fine material starts settling down. So you go from coarser sand to finer sand to eventually silt and clay. So A and B are really the first steps, right? So A and B are the first steps. And then the tail end of the turbidity flow is where you get a little bit of, of rippling, and so these ripple marks, so that would be uh, sequence C and D occur as well, but here the sediment is so fine that you don't make the ripples, you make more of this lamination, so sediment that's maybe, that's less than one centimeter here. And then finally, finally uh, uh, unit E is where there's just quiet waters, there's no more turbidity, and, and whatever is still suspended in the water column eventually settles down slowly over time um, and makes a capping unit for the Bama sequence. And often this unit is bioturbated, lots of worms and organisms start burrowing through here looking for organic material. And then this next layer up here is the next turbidity current, right? So usually there's a scour mark, right, where there's uh, erosion from the turbidity avalanche coming down and taking the parts of the top of letter E off and then making a new Bama sequence up here, right? So that's uh, the Bama sequences. Um, sediment solids use those quite a bit to determine their environment, their deposition. So actually, I'm going to stop here and make another video for this next part.